welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Armenia and Azerbaijan are locked in a renewed dispute. And as Russia tries to mediate, the European Commission and the United States are putting skin in this game. Angry and exhausted workers are striking in the United Kingdom and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is under fire for thinking up rules to block protests instead of solving their problems. And bad news from the Australian Open in Melbourne as 22-time Grand Slam champion Rafael Nadal calls it quits after yet another injury. In 2020, Armenia and Azerbaijan fought a bitter war, the Lachin Corridor, which links Armenian residents in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region with Armenia, remains the center of friction. Russia is mediating this crisis but is increasingly under pressure as Armenia gets renewed attention from the European Commission and other places. Abdul from People's Dispatch is with us in the studio for more. Hi, Abdul. Abdul, can you give us some of the recent history of the Lachin Corridor and why it has become a centre of friction again? Well, uh, as you rightly pointed out, there is a long history behind it. But at this, what is happening at now basically is related to some environmental activists. That's what uh, the Azerbaijanis are claiming have moved into the Lachin uh, Corridor since December uh, last year. And uh, they have... According to the Armenian claims, they, have, they are blocking the movement of people from the, uh, uh, the, the Nagorno-Karabakh, the reason where uh, uh, Armenians, the, the, the reason which is under dispute between the Armenian and Azerbaijan for a very long time now. And uh, uh, that basically is causing, uh, according to the Armenian version, is causing, causing the uh, kind of uh, problem uh, for the, uh, the, for the uh, economy of the reason, for the, uh, the movement of people. And uh, uh, Armenia claims that that may lead to the humanitarian crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, though Russians have, though who are there as a peacekeeping force since right. 2020, are denying such uh, 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 claims. But Armenia is quite insistent on that. Uh, uh, I think earlier this week uh, there was a, 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 a statement made by the Armenian president, which also, uh, though it was. It was basically about the having and exercises of the collective security organization, uh, treaty organization uh, that led to a speculation in the Western press and in uh, other uh, places that the, the, the conflict mm. is basically going to be renewed again. So that is uh, the question at this moment. Uh, it should also be noted that there the, though the, there is a peacekeeping mission uh, headed by Russia and there, is, there had been bilateral talks, trilateral talks between Armenia, Azerbaijan and Russia for, uh, since 2020 onwards, right. uh, there were minor clashes uh, uh, between the forces, Armenian forces and Azerbaijani forces. In September, uh, dozens of uh, soldiers were killed from both sides when there was an eruption of a, a sudden conflict in the region. Uh, Armenia has also claimed that a part of the, its territory, apart from the Nagorno-Karabakh, is also directly under control of Azerbaijan since 2020, and Russia should do something to uh, uh, asking Armenia to, uh, Azerbaijan, sorry, to withdraw its forces. So these are the uh, issues which basically has led to a kind of heating of uh, the conflict at this moment and uh, led to the speculation that uh, there will be another conflict in the larger uh, region. Right, Abdul. Abdul, what are the kind of stakes that the other countries in the region and beyond imagine for themselves or see themselves as playing in this uh, particular dispute? Well, this is a very con uh, complex uh, situation at this moment. If you see, traditionally it was considered that since the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, uh, and since 1988, when the Nagorno-Karabakh issue emerged, uh, Armenia has a very close relationship with Russia. Uh, and Azerbaijan was kind of uh, looking towards West uh, traditionally, ever since the 1991, 90. Uh, but uh, in the re since 2020, the alignments have changed uh, in a very uh, complex way. Okay. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, in, despite the fact that Armenia was considered a close uh, Russian ally, Russia did not intervene uh, in any in decisive way when the 
Azerbaijani forces uh, went in and captured a part of Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, and that led to a kind of a realignment, as I, as I said before. Uh, meanwhile, Turkey has also come into the picture and has become a close ally to Azerbaijan. And uh, Turkey's help was very uh, crucial uh, during the 2020 conflict, which led to uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis gaining upper hand vis-a-vis uh, -vis Arme uh, uh, Armenia. But there is also an angle of European uh, powers playing some politics in the region and of course the US. Uh, the US has been trying to uh, uh, push uh, Azerbaijan for its own strategic reasons in the, uh, in the region, in the larger region. Uh, one should understand that post 1990s US had a very strong presence in the region, militarily presence, military presence sorry, but that has basically uh, gone down in recent uh, period. Uh, primarily because of the aggressive uh, 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 foreign policy stances taken by Putin uh, okay. in that what we call the old uh, Soviet Union uh, constituents right. in the region. Uh, so there is a US angle and particularly due to the war in, uh, uh, in the Eastern Europe, uh, uh, the Russian operations in Ukraine, uh, there is an attempt by the European powers to kind of kind of do some kind of uh, intervention mm -hmm. in Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict to open some kind of a second front, okay. which could lead to a, a, a kind of a deterioration of Russia's position in the region. So Armenia in the last few months has uh, raised uh, the issue of Russia not addressing its concern vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan and therefore it has led to growing uh, expression of concerns, growing uh, disagreements on CSTO uh, and other uh, regional groupings. Uh, and so for particularly when uh, the CS, uh, collective security uh, treaty organizations uh, operation became an issue, uh, that basically uh, was a hint that uh, uh, the, re, uh, the conflict may uh, re-emerge and uh, will drag Russia and other uh, regional and global players into the region. Right, Abdul. So it's becoming a place to actually keep track of. In exactly. Thanks a lot for joining us. A spate of protests has rocked the UK government for well over a year. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, is now trying to push changes in the public order bill. Striking workers see these changes as a clear attempt to curtail their justified demands and their rights. The changes will empower the police to intervene even more strongly against protesters, but the unions say the strikes erupt for a reason and that the government must solve their problems. We have Prashant from People's Dispatch to discuss the issue. So Prashant, hundreds of protests actually going on for the last one year or longer in uh, the UK. Can you talk about why people are protesting, who they are? Right, Pragya, so what we're seeing right now is uh it's quite unique, I would say, because you have sectors across the United Kingdom, uh, very essential sectors actually protesting and protesting very, you know, very vociferously about what uh, they are calling very clearly as insufficient pay hikes. Now, I mean, over the past one month, we've seen uh, nurses, we've seen doctors, we've seen ambulance drivers, rail workers, uh, teachers now or, or have balloted to, uh, to go on strike. We've had mail workers, right. you know, just, just a cross-section of the number of various groups of people who are uh, protesting, uh, you know, talking about their hikes. And uh, this is at a very important time in the UK's history because we know that inflation has been quite high. It had reached up to, I, I believe, 11% or so before coming down a bit in December. The latest numbers, uh, you know, say that it's, uh, the December numbers, I believe, are, I think, about 10.5%. And in this context, the pay rise that the government has offered is what has really annoyed and angered all the workers because in most of these cases, for instance, the, let's look at the nurses or NHS staff in general, there's been an average of about 4.75 to 5% pay hike that has been offered. So when you have 10% inflation, but say about a 5% pay hike, that basically means that your real pay, the value of your pay is actually coming down. So right. whatever pay hike you're getting is vanishing because of the inflation that the people are suffering. And uh, in this context, uh, you know, if you look at some of the numbers, it's quite uh, disastrous. For instance, I think uh, the UK Trade Union Congress has pointed out that the average real pay is actually less than what it was in 2008. 
that's 13, 14 years ago, 15 years ago now. Okay. So uh, it's uh, the current pays average pays less than that, and uh, household disposable incomes have fallen by 3.3 percent in 2022, and that's the biggest annual decline in a hundred years. So these are important numbers. Like in the hundred years, it's the biggest annual uh, decline. And these these uh, can, these situations are set to worsen even further to the extent that it's worse than the 50s when first uh, numbers started to you know be collected. So that's really where we are at right now. 15 million people are struggling to afford basic costs, for instance. And in the midst of all this, what we do see is that the government is proposing pay hikes, which are nowhere close to inflation. So which is what has really you know angered the workers so much. So for instance, right now that is. On Wednesday and Thursday, nurses were protesting. We do know that on February 1st, on the other sections, on February 6th, uh, the nurses and the ambulance drivers are both going to go off strike, which will really you right. know, hit the healthcare system. And uh, it's uh, in all these places, I think the demand is exactly the same. They're like, at least give us a pay hike which matches inflation plus a bit extra, so that you know we at least maintain our living standards. And whereas the government, you know, the government and various uh, the employers, for instance, they're completely refused. Uh, to you know, consider this option at all. There are negotiations taking place, but all these negotiations are kind of falling short because of this. So there are, of course, there's a lot of uh, complexity about the negotiations, the numbers, various other aspects, and even in uh, cases where the payoff hike is much more than slightly more than even they're not close enough to inflation. Okay. But there are other conditions imposed which talk about job losses, which talk about the workers having to spend more time in work, which actually means that their working conditions worsen. Right. So these are some of the reasons that the trade unions are considered, you know, going on strike. Right. The parliament is also going over the changes to a law, which has, you know, which the government has tried to say is actually in sync with international norms. What is this all about? So what the government is trying to do is basically impose conditions whereby workers going on strike in certain sectors right. will still have to maintain a particular amount of staffing. Okay. So this is basically, it is very clearly an anti-strike law. Right. So the government is trying to dress it up by saying that, you know, oh, this is about maintaining essential services, this is about the larger good of the people, but let's call it what it is. It is basically a law to sort of uh, hinder workers' right to strike. And this is, this is part of the conservative government's larger tendency, which has been to try to restrict strikes and protests by workers as much as possible. And it's a very interesting thing because I think one of the leaders of the nursing uh, strike uh, said that, you know, to in, uh, with 40,000 vacancies, Mm -hmm. in the nursing sector, even on an average day, you cannot have the minimum staffing that the government is calling for, right? So this, by ah, the, this okay. law, the government says there should be minimum staffing. So that uh, the union leader is saying that even on a day when there is no strike, we are not able to give, offer this minimum staffing because of the fact that there are so many vacancies. And why are there so many vacancies? There are so many vacancies because staying in the service is not profitable. It's not, not forget profitable. It does not, uh, it, you know, you cannot, you know, meet your needs. You cannot have a livelihood with these kind of salaries, so people are living, leaving in large numbers. And also, <clears throat> there's a very important thing to note, which is that wage growth in the private sector reached 7.2%, that is, in the three months leading to November, uh, before adjusting for inflation. Whereas in the public sector, it's 3.3%. Okay. So it's also that employees see that in the private sector, they are getting slightly better, still not enough, but slightly better. So we have cases, for instance, of you know, a lot of people, depending on food banks, say, employees of various government services depending on food banks. And there was this very insensitive conservative MP who said that the nurses are having to go to food banks because they're bad at budgeting, right? So okay. these kind of insensitive comments further angering uh, the workers. So this law that the government is promoting, it's backfired because, you know, the government has said that this is, you know, this is on lines with what the ILO says, this is on lines with what the US says, and both the ILO and apparently the US uh, Labor Secretary, if I'm not mistaken, uh, both said that we don't really agree with this. And it, there was a bit of irony there because you have two strike-breaking governments, the US and the UK trading charges saying, no, no, you are, <laughs> you know, you are worse at treating employees than we are, <laughs> which is highly ironic. But nonetheless, the fact remains that uh, this uh, law, which again, workers have protested against in large numbers, all the unions came together to protest against it a couple of days ago, I believe, yeah. is something that is sort of designed to uh, prevent strikes. And the important thing is that this is, what the government is doing is part of their larger framework, which is again more austerity policies. They say they don't have, they don't have money, but there is no tax taxation of the super rich, which for instance, the Oxfam report pointed Absolutely. out that in so many countries across the world, if you're able to tax the super rich, you will be able to plug these holes uh, in health services, in education services, in transport services. You'll be able to actually pay people. Uh, and if you're able to pay people, the whole global 
uh, the, the national standard of living improves because people are able to spend. Then, you know, it, <clears throat> there is a, it makes sense for businesses to produce. So this whole cycle is stuck because of these austerity policies which the government follows, which, which says, you know, uh, don't tax the rich, uh, reduce spending, and then let everyone figure it out for themselves because that's what works apparently. Right, Kishan, thanks for joining us. After injuries to his rib, abdomen and foot, Rafael Nadal has hurt his hip and pulled out of the Australian Open after two games. He's likely to need rest for several weeks, admitting he felt mentally destroyed by the loss and the injury while promising he will keep fighting. Nadal ended the 2022 season on a disappointing note as well. Siddhant Ani joins us with more on what's happening. Sadhan, good to have you on the show again. Uh, Sadhan, so Nadal, another another new injury after many in the past. Uh, what gives over here? I think uh, I think it's age, Pragya. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what more to uh, say about it because my, so for example, my parents who are almost eighty now, um, they happen to be in Sydney at the moment and and. Uh, particularly for my mother, who's a huge Rafael Nadal fan, uh, all she wanted to do was to see him play one last Australian Open. Now, the, while there is a certain amount of joy associated with uh, a, a certain kind of player or or someone that you enjoy watching in, in, on a sporting field, participating in an event, uh, unfortunately. Time for these people run, runs out. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, a, a couple of months ago, or not, not even a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, we had the culmination of a World Cup that ended most brilliantly for Lionel Messi and his legacy in terms of the sport of football and uh, what a major event sort of brings to it. In the case of Rafael Nadal, unfortunately, as much as he's popular in in the whole world, and as much as um, he's kind of put his name in the game for this whole goat debate that happens, particularly in the case of uh, individual sport, right? Like a like a one person sport, like tennis, which is all about the Federers, the Nadals, the Djokovic's uh, these days, and of course. Uh, Serena Williams and others in in the women's game, uh, but I think time is now done for most of these guys. You see, in build up tournaments, how difficult it is for them to come up to the same level as younger players and even be able to compete. So maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's time to say enough is enough. Okay, Sadhan, but he doesn't seem to be in a mood to do that. Um, there are other players who've, you know, sort of given interviews and said we played our last game and come join us and play and done that with him. And so he has this example in front of him, but uh, there's a sort of like striving to continue on. Yeah, I, and he's a bit younger, uh, younger than Roger Federer for sure, uh, by a few years. Um, and also perhaps someone who has prided himself on this, like, um, extra physicality, you know, where the entire game was based not just on, of course, the inherent talent that he has, but also the amount of effort he put into it, the amount of physicality actually, uh, like in terms of training and being able to overcome uh, the physical issues that come with like grappling this sport on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so in that sense, it's always hard to say no. It's always hard to say, like, it's my, my time is up. And and when someone is paying you uh, millions of dollars to sort of stick around and, and carry on doing it, it makes it that much harder even. By and large, the these large uh, competitions, the Grand Slam competitions, the US Opens, the French Opens, the Australian Open and all of that, where uh, these players have become kind of the, the draws that bring in all the crowds, that bring in all the money, that bring in the sponsorship revenue, they are starting to say, okay, now is the time to think about the sport once again, to to to, to step back a little bit and see where the system is um, and how we are building up 
a talent pool that will allow us once again to bring in the the kind of eyeballs that require the sport to sustain itself and i think it's a again it, it's been happening for two or three years but now is the time when really men's tennis in particular has to take stock and say ki the nadal djokovic um, federer era is over now we have to say uh, like do we have a sport in which people all over the world are participating enjoying uh, and sharing a lot more than ha- is just limited to these personalities and can we build on that if yes then there's a future if not then we have to move on to other things right sadant uh, thanks for joining us and that's all we have for today thank you for watching daily debrief do come back to us tomorrow you can find our stories on people's dispatch.org and our social media updates on facebook twitter and instagram